Hello everyone, this is the March 2020 Lockheed Vega update. Uh, Kermit Weeks is um, Lockheed Vega that was built in 1929, so it's 91 years old now and we're working on bringing it back to life. Um, a couple years ago we restored the wing, ready for fabric, tails ready for fabric. We started on the fuselage, found out the fuselage was in a little bit rougher shape than we first thought and hoped. Uh, wasn't as nice as the wing. Uh, when we look at the structure that we have inside the fuselage, you can see, you know, the reasoning why we needed to replace quite a bit of the wood. Almost all the wood would be replaced. Alright, um, earlier when we were looking at the original fuselage structure, we saw the bulkheads that were in there. Lockheed calls, but what we all call bulkheads, uh, are frames. These are called diaphragms. So diaphragm number one is the firewall. Then two, three, four is where the front spar is. Six is where the rear spar is. All the way back to 15 at the tail where the tail cone would attach. There's a nine and a half in there, so there's really 16, even though we only number them up to 15. They're actually numbered nine, nine and a half, and 10 when they added one in. When it became the, from a five-seater to a seven-seater, the structure changed, they added in an extra one. Um, so what we had to do is generate from, we had the drawings for all the diaphragms, which is awesome, because it shows us how thick the, each lamination is supposed to be, how wide the, everything is supposed to be, how long the scarf joints are supposed to be, where the scarf joint should be located on the structure, somewhere on this perimeter that should be located. So it was really good information to have those original Lockheed drawings. We didn't have any drawings for the jigs and fixtures and tooling to make this or, or, or make the, um, the, the fuselage skin. What we did have were some nice factory photos that showed some of that in the factory so you could get an idea of what they did just dimensionally and we had to create it all. So what we did is we, um, we used uh, SolidWorks with 3D CAD software that we use for a number of things. So we generated the fuselage shape, everything in SolidWorks to generate everything to make our mold and to extract out all the tooling that we needed to make. So everything is working from a common shape and um, it worked out really well to be able to develop the tool. So we drew that up, we cut it out on the CNC router. You can see this is this is a number one. So this is going to be the firewall uh, location for the for the um, on the fuselage. This will be a total of 23 layers thick of 1 8 inch thick laminations. So right now we look on here we have six so far and it'll come out, that's six, so there's gonna be six more, it's 12, six more, so it'll be almost four times that thick. It's gonna be out here with 23 layers. That's how the drawing was originally set up and the, the original part was made. The way that these are done is you have to put on a la one layer at a time, and then the first layer goes on. There's a scarf joint, which is a long tapered splice that you use in woodworking, and depending on how thick it is, how long that scarf needs to be. These are 1 8 inch thick, so the drawing's called out for a 1 and 3 quarter inch long scarf joint. So we built a fixture to be able to do the scarfing, and one end is beveled this way, and the other end is beveled that way, so that as these two sticks come together, the two bevels line up, and it makes a flush joint. So you can see here, this was a, a scarf joint here, coming through. Um, so, glue one on, let it dry. Then the next one, the scarf joint, is located on the other side of the airplane. This is the one side of the airplane, the left or right, and that's the other side over there. So each time you alternate where the scarf joints are so that you have continuous wood between two scarf joints each time. And it makes it really, really strong. You don't have a concentration of a bunch of splices in one area. 
what we do is we make all these up with wood strips that are a little bit too wide. And then once, um, once we have it all laminated up, we'll go through and then get sized exactly nice and flat on the front face, the back face, to the exact thickness that it needs to be. Some of these diaphragms will end up with plywood facing on both sides or one side. Some of them have plywood just in one particular location, maybe where a fitting or some pulleys mount, something like that. But somewhere there's going to be plywood on almost all. Uh, and that just adds for the strength for the, when you're bolting to it to keep from crushing it this way when you bolt it. So um, all of these are done with a, a cold uh, drive-in. There's no steaming or, or soaking and wetting them down to be able to do that. The, um, so, so often, you know, we, we forget things in engineering and design that guys figured out a long time ago. Um, and so it's it's pretty good idea if you have the information from on the original design like we have here, and the drawing showed us that it was one eighth inch thick laminations on this one. It's a good idea to do that, even though you look at it and think, oh man, I could make them out of something thicker than that, you know, why would it matter? So we, we did some experimentation with that, Callan, Callan did, and um, he, he found out that, you know, this one requires an eighth of an inch thickness, maximum, if you're going to bend this spruce around here and not have it crack. You go any thicker than that, and it's going to crack before you can bend it around there and have it snug. So those guys are pretty sharp. In the tail end of the airplane, the rearmost three diaphragms are 100 thousandths thick, uh, about 3.30 seconds. These, uh, the, this one and three others are eighth inch. And then the remainder, uh, number nine and a half through three, or number two actually, are all one-sixth of an inch thick, which is 0.167 inches, not quite three-sixteenths of an inch. Those get so so much larger so quick to get to the big part of the fuselage that they could use a thick piece of wood. And while it may be only stacking up to be an inch, there's six plies instead of being in here where you would have eight plies. Or with 100,000, you'd have 10 plies to get an inch thick. So they, they figured out how thick of a piece of wood they could get by with to have as many, as few laminations as they could to get the structure the way they wanted. Sure, you could do it all out of something really thin and, and spend lots of time doing lots of laps, but you know, why? You know, they, they were in production, they didn't want to waste any time, so they were pretty efficient with it. Um, so what we came up with, uh, Callan did, is a method for snugging these, these guys up. Uh, so it gets each of the, the laminations get cut to length, get scarfed. We know how long each one of these needs to be as it stacks up on this particular part. So we can pre-cut all that stuff, get it ready. And then we use these large band clamps to squeeze it together and hold the glue pressure, the clamping pressure. We can torque these to about 500, um, a tension of about 550 pounds, the tension in this, each of these two straps. Um, a skinny one takes one strap, skinny diaphragm one strap. Some of these that are going to be wider or take three or four. So it's just a matter of getting the, the clamping load and distribution that we need, um, depending on how wide it is. This particular one was glued up yesterday. Um, it's ready to take this band off, clean up any little bit of you know, lumps of glue here and there, and then um, it'll be ready to add another layer on. And the way that Cal does that is this, this piece will be laying on a table. Um, He'll take the stick and wrap it into an arc, overlapping itself, pop it inside the clamp, and it's held in the clamp. And there's no glue on the stick. He then applies all the glue to this piece, then brings this with the stick over, wraps it on, gets it all in position where it needs to be, snugs these up, and there it is. And in the summertime, we can do sometimes two laps a day, depending on how fast things are drying. We do have this heat box here we're using during the colder, you know, Florida winter is when we have to have to put long, you know, like jeans on. So on those days, you know, we were able to, to warm it up. 
and uh, get the glue to kick off. And here's a number nine and a half. I mentioned there were 15 stations, but we have a, a half station for nine, so this is the tooling for that. This guy has its first layer on, so you can see here where we've got the scarf joint right here, and this, this one tapers off behind, and this one tapers off on the front, and then come right together to make that closed loop. Next will be the, the next one, this joint will be on the other side to alternate them back and forth. This is um, number nine, which is just ahead of this, it's, it's getting bigger. So this one's a little bit larger than nine and a half, eight will be bigger, seven, six, five, five is the largest, that's the peak. So here you can see we've got two laps on this one, got the scarf joint here on this side, on the second one, and then the first one there's no scarf joint here because the scarf joint's on the other side over there. This is just a stick for uh, the clamping pressure across the scarf joint right there, that's what that's for. It just keeps the, the clamp from uh, digging into the wood. Um, once the diaphragms have all their layers on, then here's an example, and this is number 14. So this is not the rearmost one, but it's the second one from the rear. 15 is the back end of the airplane, 14 is the next one forward. And it's basically just a support about halfway between the leading edge and the trailing edge of the horizontal and vertical stabilizers. And it'll actually get cut out on both sides because the horizontal stab goes through the fuse lodge. But it's a complete piece right now. You can see it's only a half inch thick. It's very thin, it's only a half inch thick. But look at all these hundred thousand layers it has. Look at how many layers are on there. And it's actually, if we look at 14, it's 11 layers thick. So it's, uh, it's quite, quite a lot of work to build this little guy. And then the one that was behind it, 15, is even smaller uh, and has a lot of laminations on it as well. This is now ready to go and have the exterior shape machined to size. What we've done with our jigs is we have those set up where they fit on a, on a base plate. And there's a base plate for 14 all the way to you know, 15 through one, all of them. And this has reference holes in it here, here, here. So we have X, Y coordinates at zero, zero. This will go on the CNC machine, be located and squared on a jig, they'll locate it. And then the CNC program that we'll use from our CAD system will cut the outside to the exact shape that it needs to be in size and actually cut the taper into the side of it. So if you think about as the fuselage is getting larger going forward, these diaphragms are not going to be square. The skin is going to hit on an angle like this. It's going to hit and, and so the diaphragm has to be machined to that mating angle so that it can be glued on. Something that's real skinny like this is, is you know, not much of a, of a difference. But when you get on those that are two and five eighths of an inch thick, a diaphragm that's that thick, it's quite a lot of surface area there that needs to be tapered exactly right. The, in the, the originals, they had patterns that they would use and put a template on this face of this one, it would locate on, and they would mark where it goes. They had a template for the other size on the other side, mark it, and then they would hand shape all those in with planes and blocks. Um, we have the the technology today to take out some of that handwork and do it more accurately with the CNC, and it'll do it relatively fast. So each one, all 16 diaphragms, go back on their plate, and you can see over there, there's number eight in the distance and a whole stack of them behind it, ready to go. We haven't made those diaphragms yet. That's the tooling just to make them. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we, we know how long each one of these strips has to be. And we've calculated all that out, and we've got it by diaphragm number, the, the laminations, exactly the length that need to cut out. And all these that are in green, that's completed. These over here, that's what we still are working on. So it's diaphragm one through 15, and all the detailed information, how thick, how wide, how many laminations, and how long everything is. So we've done all this math ahead of time so that this production can can continue each um, each layer. Hopefully, we try to get Cal tries to get um, 
one layer on three of them at a time on a, on a, a given morning or, or afternoon, and then the next day, repeat again. Um, this, on the sticks that make up the diaphragms, you can see here, here's a couple of them. And these are the one-sixth of an inch thick. So uh, this is for, this one, number nine. So number nine. And so this is one of one of six that'll end up on number nine. Number nine has two. Here's two more. So that's, you know, number three, number four, and then five and six. We make, we make these things just a little bit, about an eighth of an inch too thick, so that we can go in and machine the outside to the perfect shape. When we do that machining, we'll also be notching in at the top, bottom, left, and right. There'll be a notch for on all of them for the longerons. It's long, skinny strips that run nose to tail that lock all these together. And there'll be some of the the uh, fitting holes and things will be drilled in as well. So we have some reference points where to start putting the metal fitting plates and brackets back on. All that information that's in the drawing, so we can use that right from the original Lockheed data. A uh, little bit bigger picture here, what we're seeing on this looks like a work table right now, what we're using as a work table, but it's the, the fuselage assembly fixture. So it's bolted to the floor and it's shot in with a laser. And what it does is at each of these stations, this 2x4 is just in there to hold the table up right now, but it, it'll be gone. But at each of these points, we'll have this particular one is number six. So number six diaphragm will be in here. Laying, the airplane is laying on the side. This is the top. That's the belly over there. So the airplane will be rolled over 90 degrees. And each of these diaphragms will be mounted in this fixture at each one of these stations to hold it exactly where it needs to be. We uh, shot all this in with a laser. It's nice and square and level. So this is just like what the factory had. We have a picture of their jig. Um, their 2x4s are dimensionally different than today, but they're actually 2x4. But uh, other than that, it's the same way that they did. This stick here is a reference line of the center line of the airplane. The top surface of this stick is the center line of the fuselage. So this, this stick right here would be pointing right at the center top of the fuselage to stick on that side right to the center line on the belly. That way we know, uh, you know that everything's level, it's all square. Once all that's mounted in, some of the other structure is added in between the diaphragms. Then that first skin that we looked at over there will come on here and get fitted on. Once it's fitted, then it'll get glued on right in this fixture. Then we'll have half the fuselage will have skin on it, all bonded to the structure. It'll lift out go in the support cradle, and then have the second side put on. And that's how it goes together. That's the way the factory did it as well. They put one skin on in a fixture like this, it was bolted to the floor. The second side got put on, effectively sitting on some cur some arch-shaped saw horses, and then put the second side on. There's a lot of work that goes on before you put that second side on. You get a lot of the fittings and bits and pieces and uh, structure for holding the seats and the floors. There's just a lot of stuff that happens before you close it out so that you're not crawling through a little hole all the time. But um, you know, that's the basic procedure of how it's done. Uh, one little thing here I'll grab just to show you. We talk about the diaphragms and the laminations. Number 13 diaphragm had 28 laminations. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Number 13 is actually made in two pieces piece is a continuous oval like these that we've looked at. It's about that big. And then the second piece was just the bottom half. And that bottom half is tapered and blended in. And that was um, kind of a, an update that the factory did at 30, 31, whenever they switched to the bigger engine in seventh place. They beefed up 13 and put a heavier uh, bracket in there for the tailwheel suspension now. So it became uh, two pieces put together, like double diaphragm in the bottom, single diaphragm at the top. But you can see all the laminations there. You can see a little bit of the curvature of when it was glued up around the form. But it's just kind of cool to have this piece around and be able to show what it really looks like when you cut it too, because we really don't want to cut these to look inside. We need to use them. 
So um, that's where we are at this point. Um, coming up, the next steps are building the second skin, building more diaphragms. Once we, um, we get the second skin done, we're basically finished with the mold for a while. We can set all that stuff aside. There's a few other pieces we need to make off the mold. Uh, the doublers that go inside the skin and a few other structural members that we'll use the mold to help us with. Um, other than that, then, it's, then it'll be soon time to start getting the diaphragms once they're machined, mounted in here, start fitting up the structure, and uh, yeah, start looking like a fuselage again. Thank you very much. See you next time.